putting up with the pom-pom girls, but they do need their practice. Um, tonight is the fifth in the lecture series, Marxist Alternatives to Continuing Crisis, sponsored by the Lectures Committee. And tonight's speaker is Erwin Silber, the executive editor of The Guardian, which off its letterhead is an independent radical news weekly that, uh, follows, that is, follows a Marxist-Leninist line, has been publishing since 1948. And, uh, uh, Erwin Silber's just returned recently, well actually in December, from a month-long visit to North Vietnam and also he visited the liberated zones in South Vietnam, uh, Quang Tri province to be specific. And tomorrow uh, at noon in room 205-206 of the Mo Memorial Union, he'll be showing slides and giving a discussion and talk about his trip to North Vietnam and what's going on there now as far as reconstruction goes. <coughs> and. The, t uh, the title of his speech tonight is The World in Great Disorder, or Why Henry Kissinger Can't Sit Down. So here's Erwin Silver. I always, uh, takes a little adjustment for me. Are you ready? Um, it's always a bit of adjustment for me when I uh, come back to a university, since I have prodigiously avoided universities ever since uh, graduating from one uh, more years ago than I care to re recollect. Um, and uh, I always think of uh, what I was taught in school, and uh, uh, which is uh, one of the reasons why I hesitated by coming back to universities. Of course, when I went to school, uh, we didn't have a lecture series such as this one. Uh, about uh, Marxism in the world, the Marxist alternatives, and so on, uh, which may in a way be progress of a sort, although that remains to be determined. It's 127 years since Karl Marx and Frederick Engels wrote the Communist Manifesto. And uh, in the course of that 127 years, I don't uh, imagine anybody could come up with uh, an accurate figure of how many times uh, bourgeois scholars and economists and politicians have said, well, uh, uh, Marxism is no longer relevant. History has made it outdated. Uh, that's part of what I got when I went to school. And probably some of you get the same thing in your classrooms. Uh, so it's, uh, I think, appropriate uh, to realize that in the course of these 127 years, uh, despite all of the dire predictions to the contrary, Marxism, and subsequently expanded by the teachings of uh, uh, revolutionaries like uh, Lenin and Mao, uh, Marxism has uh, encompassed huge portions of the Earth's surface and uh, has become uh, uh, at least, let us say, relevant. Uh, so relevant, in fact, that it becomes necessary to discuss it, and I suspect that in his uh, uh, secret life, Henry Kissinger probably uh, dips into the works of Karl Marx every once in a while to try and figure out what the hell is going on anyway. Um, I, in a way, like to take my text from uh, Mr. Kissinger, uh, since uh, you uh, may have noticed that there is a debate now taking place within the highest circles of our government, uh, specifically between Mr. Kissinger and Mr. Schlesinger. Um, it seems to focus at the moment around the question of Cambodia. Uh, and uh, the two uh, points of view put forward, uh, one is by Mr. Kissinger to the effect that the situation is grim, and Mr. Schlesinger's point of view is no, it's hopeless. Uh, I think that uh, that contradiction within the American ruling class uh, would serve as a good text, not only for the situation confronting U.S. imperialism in uh, Indochina, uh, but uh, the problem that imperialism faces throughout the world today, and that is uh, it is clearly grim and rapidly becoming hopeless. I haven't uh, heard a newscast or uh, read a newspaper since this morning, so I don't know how many more provinces have fallen in South Vietnam. Uh, I don't know what the sound of a province falling is like. I assume it's something like dominoes falling. <laughs> Although I think if the truth be known, it's more like a house of cards coming down. There is great disorder in the world. 
and uh, even Mr. Kissinger agrees with the uh, Communist Party of China in recognizing that that is the reality. Of course, they have different views on it. The Communist Party of China says it's a good thing, and Mr. Kissinger does not agree with them on that particular point. Uh, you don't have to be uh, uh, terribly knowledgeable in the world to realize that the world is indeed in great disorder. Uh, we just uh, pick up our daily newspapers, look around the world, from Southeast Asia to the Middle East, the Persian Gulf, to uh, uh, the remnants of Portuguese Africa, Rhodesia, South Africa, Greece, Cyprus, Portugal, Western Europe, Latin America. Uh, to leave our own country alone for a moment, we have our own particular form of disorder. Uh, to recognize that, indeed, something on a uh, momentous scale is taking place. Here at home, we have that disorder duplicated with the most severe economic crisis since the late 1930s and uh, the um, uh, virtual discrediting of all of the political institutions of American society uh, as evidenced uh, most uh, uh, clearly with uh, what's uh, euphemistically been called uh, Watergate and uh, the uh, uh, revelations concerning the activities of the CIA and the FBI and so on. Uh, of course, people on the left have a tendency to say, well, what's so new about that? Uh, a lot of these things that are coming out now, we told you about some time ago. <coughs> but uh, I think it is important to uh, uh, keep in mind that what we are witnessing is not simply the revelation of the same pattern that's been taking place over the course of many decades, but that indeed it is at a significantly new level. Uh, how, should we, how should we sum this up? this great disorder in the world. What does it really mean? Uh, is it just uh, a lot of changes taking place, a lot of motion? In my view, what we are seeing is the uh, last stages in the collapse of imperialism. And uh, what that represents is not simply uh, the giving up of colonies or uh, countries becoming independent, but in effect we are uh, living in the waning days of an entire epoch, the epoch of capitalism, which developed in the 20th century to monopoly capitalism or uh, uh, imperialism. And what is characteristic of the system of imperialism? Uh, and it's important to say that this is a system because uh, uh, in the recent uh, 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 Indochina war, there were many people who became disenchanted with that war. Uh, many of whom, uh, very sincerely motivated, said, how could we have made such a terrible mistake? What was wrong with our policy in Indochina? But the fact is that uh, imperialism is not a policy. <coughs> imperialism is a system, a system of organizing society and societies on a world scale. And therefore, its policies are circumscribed by its necessities, meaning that uh, events such as the war in Indochina, the present crisis in the Middle East, uh, the collapse of empires, uh, these are not the outgrowths of policy or anything that could be changed if this policy were corrected. But it is the maturation of the internal contradictions of a system which has come to its dying days. What is characteristic of this system? Because uh, I was just talking earlier to some people who uh, study e economics at Iowa State University and uh, I could not possibly hope to duplicate uh, the report that uh, they gave as to uh, what some of the instructors uh, think economics is about. Uh, but uh, there is a, a, a view that one can discuss capitalism uh, as though it's a system that exists uh, pretty much the way uh, conceived in the head of people like uh, Adam Smith and economists back in the 18th century and that the only thing wrong with America today is that we've departed from the basic principles of capitalism. The fact is that monopoly capitalism, imperialism, is the inevitable outgrowth and development of the capitalist system. And uh, it's no accident that Lenin, in writing his classical work on imperialism, described imperialism not simply as the final stage of capitalism, but its moribund stage, the stage at which capitalism, which when it first came onto the uh, uh, scene, when it first organized a portion of the world, uh, was a progressive development, but that this system has now gotten to the point where it can no longer 
solve the very problems that economic systems are impelled to solve. What's characteristic of the system? Well, we could list a number of things. For instance, the growth in power uh, in capitalist countries of finance capital. Uh, in the early days of capitalism, the power rested in those who owned the means of production, individual factories or mines. But today, and this is a, a characteristic of the system, it is, the real power rests with those who own and control finance capital. In other words, uh, there has been a removal from uh, a direct uh, ownership of the means of production into the ownership of accumulated capital in its finance form. Uh, another characteristic uh, is the growth of the uh, bourgeois state apparatus. Now, uh, there are some people in this country, uh, uh, there was a meeting of Republican conservatives not long ago who think that uh, uh, what we have to do is get back to the good old days, the less government the better and so on. Uh, as though the growth in the government bureaucracy uh, was some choice that was unfortunately made at some historical point. The fact is that the growth of the political state apparatus of monopoly capitalism is itself the absolute necessity in order to rationalize a system in its dying days. Just examine the huge federal bureaucracy that exists. What's its purpose, aside from uh, uh, keeping a lot of uh, university-trained professors in cushy jobs. Uh, it has another social function beside, and that is to try to uh, rationalize the irrational, to constantly intervene in what's supposed to be the normal flow of the capitalist system in order to try and make it work. Uh, supposedly, this is a free economy, and yet there is a, a bureau and an organization uh, filled with regulations which change almost weekly uh, designed to try and uh, uh, keep this whole thing in balance, uh, whether it's uh, a Federal Communications Commission or Aviation Commissions, and you can, you can list them. They run into the hundreds, securities and exchange, etc. This state apparatus is absolutely vital to the functioning of monopoly <coughs> capitalism, uh, uh, even though it can't uh, solve the problem, but the, just the sheer uh, administration of uh, this kind of advanced industrial society requires that kind of heavy bureaucratic state apparatus. And of course, uh, 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 along with that bureaucrat bureaucratic state apparatus, you have the growth of agencies such as uh, the secret police agencies, the military establishment, and so on. All of them absolutely indispensable to the rationalization of this system. What's characteristic of monopoly capitalism and uh, of the particular economic crisis that this country is in at the moment is anarchy of production. Um, the capitalist system, which when it first came onto the scene, um, was able to uh, unleash new productive forces, has now uh, reversed itself. And uh, in a world uh, of huge advanced technology, uh, it still tries to operate on the basis of what's called the laws of supply and demand. Uh, and other um, economic laws of capitalism uh, which lead not to planning of production in order to solve the problems of survival for people, uh, but simply on the basis of trying to produce things in terms of their profitability. Uh, now, people say, well, what's wrong with that if, if it works? Uh, what it produces is uh, um, huge inventories in warehouses because corporation executives sit down and try to figure out uh, what can be sold or produced at a profit. What it leads to is a crisis, for instance, take, take this problem of oil and energy. Um, now, uh, all of the uh, bourgeois economists concede that there are huge uh, natural resources in the United States of oil. But why haven't they been exploited? Very simple reason. It was much more profitable to uh, uh, exploit and merchandise oil in the Middle East and in other countries than to develop oil in this country. And that's the only reason for doing it. But what made it more profitable is one of the laws of monopoly capitalism that Marx pointed out over 100 years ago. It's called the declining rate of profit. And this declining rate of profit in the United States and in all capitalist countries is the main reason why imperialism has to develop. In other words, uh, as it becomes more and more difficult to maintain the level of profit for each individual capitalist. And you'll get the picture because this is obviously not a conspiracy. You don't have to sit down and plot it out. 
But as each individual capitalist and corporation pursues its logical purposes, uh, then it has to seek out the areas where it can increase its profits. And so this leads uh, uh, immediately to the export of capital. And that's what's uh, become particularly characteristic of this period. Uh, that is, the first capitalist countries got the jump on their rivals. Uh, and by export of capital, we mean going into other areas of the world, trying to utilize natural resources, uh, sources of cheap uh, labor power, and uh, to conquer new markets uh, in order to increase the rate of profit. Uh, what's characteristic of imperialism uh, is inter-imperialist rivalry, since it's in the very nature of this system that every corporation, every capitalist is at uh, the throat of every other capitalist. They're competing for the same buck. Uh, and this is true of uh, capitalists on a national scale as well. Uh, so uh, we have uh, uh, typical of capitalism, huge wars of inter-imperialist rivalry. The, second, the First World War, the Second World War, even though there are other characteristics to some of these wars, uh, fundamentally, they reflect the intense antagonisms between different groups of capitalists as they try first to grab different portions of the world, then to redivide it up among themselves in the search for markets and sources of profit. Today, we have uh, imperialism uh, faces this kind of a problem. There are no more areas of the world that uh, remain to be uh, conquered. They can only be transferred in terms of power. And so you have uh, a new kind of intense rivalry between the imperialist powers. Today, in particular, um, ever since uh, World War II, uh, when the United States emerged as the single most powerful capitalist country in the world, today you have a new situation. You have the emergence of the Soviet Union as a second superpower, uh, one which, uh, uh, over the course of the last 15 years, uh, has abandoned uh, the socialist path, has uh, reintroduced the capitalist class relations into its society and emerged as an imperialist rival with the United States. Uh, this rivalry between the United States and the Soviet Union is the chief source of the danger of war in the world today. All we have to do is look at the tinderbox that Henry Kissinger just walked away from, the Middle East, and uh, the only way we can understand that situation is in terms of the intense rivalry between the United States and the Soviet Union. Typical of uh, um, the age of imperialism is monopoly. Now, uh, maybe monopoly isn't uh, the dirty word it once was simply because we've gotten used to it. But uh, um, it wasn't always like that. Again, it's the natural outgrowth of uh, a capitalist system. Monopoly means uh, the um, abrogation of the very laws of capitalist development itself. In other words, uh, uh, the uh, uh, control, monopoly control over sources of raw materials or over uh, uh, labor power, uh, over uh, industrial plant, means that uh, the so-called free market that the capitalists like to talk about doesn't really operate. It means price fixing, uh, and it means uh, uh, production, uh, which can be controlled uh, totally in terms of the ability of a small handful of monopoly capitalists to control the market. <clears throat> Typical of the age of uh, capitalism and imperialism uh, is the growth of uh, corruption and crime. Now, uh, there is another debate that rages. Uh, that is, uh, does our um, set, present set of problems stem from the fact uh, that uh, most elected officials uh, in the United States are uh, pimps and scoundrels? Or does the fact that we have a group of pimps and scoundrels running the United States itself uh, uh, reflect the normal outgrowth of the imperialist system? Now, it may not be a debate that you think makes too much difference, since we're stuck with them anyway. Uh, but uh, it is important to keep in mind, uh, because uh, uh, there are some who feel the only thing we got to do is throw out this set of pimps and scoundrels and uh, replace them, uh, well, I wouldn't say with another set, uh, but uh, uh, replace them with some uh, decent people, and then maybe things would work. Uh, but the view of Marxists, of course, is that uh, uh, there is no way to solve the problems of the capitalist system by simply a cosmetic change of personality 
in those who operate that system. The real uh, uh, fundamental crisis that faces the imperialist system today uh, cannot be seen in narrow national terms. It has to be seen on a world scale. Uh, throughout the world, uh, we can uh, say that the assessment made by the Chinese Communist Party is an accurate assessment. And that is the main trend in the world today uh, can be described as countries want independence, nations want liberation, <coughs> and people want revolution. You may have heard that statement before, and if you've heard it too many times, again, it will become just a statement that the one might just repeat uh, without really thinking through. But you should determine for yourself whether or not you think that accurately reflects the real world as you're able to observe it. Uh, because uh, I think it is a very accurate reflection of what we see, particularly today in the third world, but throughout the world in general. In other words, uh, uh, imperialism, has, in effect, uh, created its own grave diggers, not only, as Marx said, on a national scale, where the capitalists bring into being the proletariat, but on a world scale, where the development of imperialism throughout the world has itself created the national liberation movements, uh, the consciousness of people on a world scale, uh, that uh, they can be masters of their own destiny, and that the way they have to do it is to rise up and fight for their independence. Uh, in uh, an interview not long ago, Henry Kissinger lamented the fact that just at the time when it seemed to him the world should be verging on internationalism, all these national movements emerged. And he thought of this uh, naturally from his point of view as a backward step. Um, well, some people might think that way. After all, uh, nationalism is a trend that accompanies the uh, uh, emergence of the capitalist system. But it is important, I think, to realize that in the present world, uh, we have a new kind of nationalism, a revolutionary nationalism, in which uh, peoples and nations emerging from exploitation and oppression of centuries uh, have forged themselves into nations and are demanding their national independence. This trend toward national independence on a world scale is a very progressive trend. It is a progressive trend because it poses itself against the main enemy of the world's peoples, that is, imperialism. Opposes itself against both of the superpowers, both of whom are trying to develop international systems in violation of the national rights and integrity of peoples. But it's not just a matter of independence. There are three aspects to that question of, uh, 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 that the Chinese put forward. It's not just that the countries want independence. Nations want liberation, meaning that those countries those peoples, which do not yet have their own country, want to have their land, their territory, their national identity liberated, want to forge themselves into a country and a people. And uh, uh, we have uh, only recently, in uh, two very graphic cases, witnessed the power of that trend in Southeast Asia and in uh, Portuguese Africa. Uh, in both of these cases, we had uh, an underdeveloped people, poorly equipped, standing up to fight against very powerful imperialist forces. And uh, when the uh, uh, patriots of Angola, Mozambique, and Guinea-Bissau began their liberation struggle in the early 60s, uh, it seemed to many uh, that it would be a very difficult process for them to win their independence. There was Portuguese colonialism backed up by US imperialism against uh, uh, the people who had the numbers, uh, but obviously didn't have the economic base, didn't have the military skill, and so on. And yet, in the course of uh, uh, something like 13 years, uh, the peoples of these countries were able to uh, overcome and defeat the last <coughs> remaining direct colonial power in the world. And in Indochina, we saw it even more graphically. Uh, with the 100-year-old uh, uh, war of the people of Vietnam and the rest of Indochina against French colonialism, finally being able to defeat directly U.S. imperialism, which intervened in Vietnam with half a million troops, uh, with a million puppet troops. And even today, I just read in today's paper, uh, the military analysts in Washington uh, still scratching their heads and trying to figure it out. After all, they left Saigon with the third largest air force in the world. Uh, a million puppet troops. And they themselves say, even though uh, the Vietnamese uh, got substantial aid 
uh, from China and the Soviet Union, it was like a drop in the bucket compared to what the U.S. poured in. Uh, nevertheless, uh, Mr. Ford and Mr. Kissinger are uh, lamenting that uh, um, we are about to lose Indochina because the Congress won't appropriate more money. Uh, but the truth of that uh, struggle in Indochina uh, is that uh, the uh, uh, trend toward uh, independence and liberation, which has the capacity for uniting the overwhelming masses of the people in any country, can be much more powerful than the massed might and technology even of U.S. imperialism. Well, here in our own country, I think we can also see uh, many of the uh, reflections of how this crisis develops. We see, uh, naturally, with the breakup of imperialism, uh, the intensification of both class and national oppression. Uh, because uh, the capitalists don't stop being capitalists simply because they take a few beatings. Uh, and uh, the need to uh, rationalize their system uh, to further to develop uh, their profit capabilities and so on, means an intensification of the contradictions here at home. Uh, the particular characteristics in our country which are important for us to keep in mind, uh, which I uh, mentioned are in terms of the class struggle and the national oppression of uh, uh, third world peoples in this country. Uh, and uh, it is no accident that we see an intensification of uh, that contradiction at this particular time as part of the general crisis of imperialism. But wherever there is oppression, there is resistance. And what is characteristic of our time is not oppression, although that is intensified by the imperialists. But the rising trend, the dominant trend, is resistance. And uh, we see that. Uh, not only in the third world, we are going to see it, and in fact have seen it, even in our own country. Um, some people uh, who, for instance, may have been active in the anti-war movement uh, in the 1960s, uh, sometimes sum it up, uh, I think, in a very uh, short-sighted way. Well, um, the anti-war movement didn't really accomplish anything uh, because the ruling class is still in power. Uh, well, uh, when uh, I was in Vietnam not long ago, and uh, speaking to some of the uh, people in the leadership of the Vietnam Workers' Party, they said, it's true, we did not defeat imperialism on a world scale. But then we didn't think that we could. We were able to defeat imperialism here in our own country. I think we have to have a realistic assessment of what uh, it was possible for a largely spontaneous, uh, non-working class base mass movement of the 60s to accomplish. And what that anti-war movement accomplished was in effect to open up a second front against the U.S. war machine here at home and uh, proved to be a very effective second front. It was not informed especially by anti-imperialist politics, but objectively it served an anti-imperialist purpose. And uh, as the uh, uh, movement developed, uh, it increasingly took on uh, more and more militant characteristics until it got to the point where um, the uh, United States Army, largely composed of working class and third world people, uh, became an ineffective fighting force. Uh, the military commanders knew in the last days of the war that the U.S. military machine in Vietnam had become unreliable. Now that is a most significant factor in imperialism uh, trying to figure out how it is going to deal with these situations as they come up again and again. The, the uh, recent uh, resurgence of interest in and popularity of Marxism uh, is itself an interesting ideological phenomenon. Now, uh, just because uh, somebody says they're a Marxist or putting forward a Marxist uh, uh, point of view, uh, that doesn't uh, mean that uh, uh, they are uh, uh, revolutionaries. Um, part of the problem is that where, as uh, these ideas become fashionable, uh, Marxism does become objectified. Uh, in the uh, preface to State and Revolution, uh, Lenin points out, and this is uh, uh, more than 50 years ago, 60 years ago, 
He says, uh, there has suddenly been a great uh, renewed interest in the writings of Karl Marx. Uh, new translations of Das Kapital appearing, and all of the bourgeois economists uh, are uh, very much interested in Karl Marx. He said, does this mean that uh, somehow the bourgeoisie is adopting Marxism? He pointed out, uh, he didn't use the term co-opt, which uh, 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 we learned how to use, but he pointed out, in effect, that the objectification of Marxism into an intellectual pursuit was itself a way of defeating and diverting revolution. That Marxism has never been uh, an academic subject. Marxism is not something you just go into a classroom and learn, although I don't want to put down the importance of learning the theory of Marxism. But Marxism is the revolutionary world outlook of the working class on a world scale. Its purpose is to provide the working class on a world scale with the scientific theory it needs in order to overthrow capitalism, make revolution, and establish a socialist society. If it is seen as anything but that, then it is no longer Marxism, but it is merely an intellectual hobby. And I think that uh, uh, it's particularly important to keep that in mind in the university surrounding. And I, I'm not uh, putting that down because uh, uh, the universities have always been uh, very important uh, uh, breeding places for revolutionaries and uh, uh, scenes of great revolutionary struggle and um, will continue to be. But it's important to keep in mind that uh, we are not discussing now uh, merely an intellectual subject. We're not discussing simply how we analyze capitalism or what the philosophy of dialectical materialism is as compared to the philosophies of Hegel or Descartes or Kant or anybody else. We are talking about the necessity not merely to understand the world, but as Marx said, to change it. And that is the purpose of understanding Marxism and adopting a Marxist outlook. That means theory separated from practice is only theory and is the very antithesis of what Marxism is about. Nevertheless, the growing popularity of interest in Marxism is in itself uh, a social phenomenon worth noting. Because flourishes of rhetoric, but very soberly, is that there is only one solution to the problems confronting the imperialist system. That solution is revolution. Now, uh, that's a kind of a scary word, even though uh, we're on the verge of celebrating the bicentennial of another revolution in this country, uh, which has also become objectified. Revolution is a scary word. But we should also understand what it means. Revolution is the transformation of society by changing the nature of the ruling class of that society, replacing one ruling class with another ruling class. It means that in capitalist society, which is ruled, however directly or indirectly, and it's very direct, although sometimes it seems uh, one or two steps removed, by a class of monopoly and finance capitalists. It is necessary to change that, to transform that society, and uh, for a new class to come to power. It is necessary to reorganize society thoroughly and completely, not only the economics, although that's fundamental, but equally important to reorganize the politics. Socialism is not merely the nationalization of the means of production. Socialism is not simply making a steel mill or a coal mine the property of the state. What is more important is which class controls the state. Because if it is still the capitalist class that controls the state, then the nationalization of the means of production becomes state capitalism and not socialism at all. 
That's why uh, Marxists have understood ever since the days of the Paris Commune, and uh, it was the basic thesis of uh, Lenin uh, when he wrote uh, his uh, work on state and revolution, that revolution meant not only changing the economic um, uh, relationships in society, but seizing state power, smashing the old state machinery of the capitalist system, and erecting a completely new political and state apparatus that corresponded to the new economic relations. In a certain sense, the real question today is not what, but how. Because uh, part of the uh, uh, popularity of Marxism reflects the fact that even uh, that Marxism, socialism, uh, and, uh, even revolution have become uh, uh, popular. Um, I, I uh, knew somebody who, uh, 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 a black militant uh, back in the 60s, uh, who when uh, Lyndon Johnson uh, went on the uh, tube and proclaimed we shall overcome, uh, said, uh, well, the difference between the civil rights movement and what was emerging at that time was that uh, the new movement was putting forward the slogan of black power. And Johnson could never say black power. It's true, he couldn't. It took Richard Nixon to say black power. All of this rhetoric has become possible, convenient, and in many ways necessary. As many different trends and tendencies now say, yes, we want socialism. It's not just a matter of saying capitalism is a dying or dead system. Socialism is necessary. The question really is how. Because unless the problem of how capitalism is overthrown, revolution is made, and socialism is built is solved, then all of the pious uh, proclamations that say, yes, we want to have socialism, don't amount to a hill of beans. It is not an easy task to seize power from an entrenched ruling class, and in this case, the most powerful ruling class in the history of the world. It will not be done by appeals to moral conscience. It will not be done by petitions. It will not be done even if we were by some miracle able to convince all of the American people to vote for a particular ticket. It wouldn't be done even if they voted for that ticket and somebody got elected and tried to institute socialism. None of that would do it because it is the jungle law of class society demonstrated over and over and over again so that it should be unmistakable that no ruling class abdicates peacefully, no ruling class simply surrenders and turns its power over to the new historical forces that are developing. What are some of the hows, then, that have to be answered if people are serious about making revolution? And I should interject at this moment, I'm not talking about the kind of revolution that was proclaimed so easily and readily just a few years ago, some of which was supposed to happen because everybody turned on. Uh, or because uh, uh, they were sexually liberated, or because uh, uh, the AM and FM stations were beginning to play rock music. Uh, I don't know if anybody took those theor theories seriously at the time, although I suspect some of the people who proclaimed them, uh, well, let's be generous and say that they had a little overdose of their uh, own weed and maybe believed them momentarily. So when I talk about revolution, I mean it very seriously. I mean that uh, uh, it's a long, protracted struggle. It doesn't get served up to us like instant coffee. Uh, it's a process that not only has to develop, but has to be developed. Uh, the objective conditions for revolution exist in our world because the capitalist system has become moribund, anachronistic, cannot function properly. Every day's newspapers prove that over and over again. But the crisis of capitalism by itself does not produce its destruction. The capitalists do not commit suicide as a class, although from time to time individuals do give up. <laughs> that means trying to make a concrete scientific analysis of what the process is about. I'd like to run down a couple of points that, in my view, are indispensable to the making of revolution. Um, you can make notes on this if you'd like, but there won't be a test. 
at least not a classroom test. There will be other kinds of tests. First, one has to say, well, if one, ruling, if one class is going out of power, who's going to take its place? Are we just going to leave a void? Uh, are we going to have uh, one uh, a grand uh, session of hand-holding and participatory democracy to uh, replace the capitalist class, which has organized all of society? Uh, some people have suggested that kind of absurdity. But 125 years ago in the Communist Manifesto, Marx and Engels pointed out very clearly, not because of any romantic inclinations about the working class, but on the basis of scientific analysis, <coughs> that in modern society, of all the classes that exist, there is only one class capable of making revolution and capable of reorganizing society as a socialist society. And uh, maybe some people think, well, uh, how many classes are there anyway? Well, there are a number of classes. Um, in the European uh, parlance, the peasantry, or in our terminology, farmers. Um, intellectuals, small business people, what the Marxists call petty bourgeoisie. Um, Intermediate-sized capitalists, um, and so on. So there are a number of classes. There are a number of other groupings within society. Students, for instance, they're not a class or youth, they're not a class, but uh, uh, they, uh, there is a, uh, an element of uh, unity and identity among such groups. And therefore, it is important scientifically to understand which classes are revolutionary and which classes, for all that they may want to make revolution, are not capable of doing it. So the Marxists say it is the working class, and in particular, within the working class, it's most proletarianized sector, the industrial working class, the working class whose labor produces the surplus value that makes society go round and whose work is the most socialized. It is this particular class that is the most revolutionary class and is the one class capable of seizing state power and reorganizing society. However, Marxists have known for a long time that while the working class must play the leading role in the revolutionary process, <coughs> the working class cannot make the revolution by itself. In fact, there is no need for the working class to make the revolution by itself. Um, probably uh, in the course of uh, readings and discussions, uh, people have raised uh, such uh, uh, questions as, well, what does uh, ultra-leftism or left sectarianism mean? Or when uh, Lenin uh, addressed the problem of uh, 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 infantile leftism and so on. What does all that mean? It means, uh, in the most fundamental sense, a view that suggests that the working class or even a small portion of the working class can make the revolution by itself without allies. That's why all of the revolutionaries who have succeeded have understood the necessity of uniting all those who can be united against the principal enemy, the imperialists, the monopoly capitalists. Because it is in the self-interest of these other classes as well who are placed in contradiction with the imperialists themselves ultimately to unite with the working class. Now, uh, they don't always see it that way. That's why they are vacillating. And they tend to go where the power is. When the monopoly capitalists seem strong, and the small capitalists, the petty bourgeoisie, the uh, peasantry, and so on, they tend uh, to uh, uh, rely upon uh, the monopoly capitalists, even though they have contradictions. But as the working class movement becomes stronger, then all of these elements are capable of being won over into an alliance with the working class. In our own country, it takes a particular form. Uh, and it's not just in this country, although it does have a particular form. Because one of the characteristics of capitalism has been the subjugation of nations and of national minorities. Uh, not simply because the capitalists are prejudiced. Some people feel that uh, uh, it all starts because of racism. And I say that racism is the outgrowth of something else, in effect. Uh, but out of the necessity of every capitalist class to have 
one portion of the working class and the workforce provide them both with a reserve army of labor and a source of additional super profits. National oppression of various kinds has become characteristic of monopoly capitalism. In our country, it has meant that Afro-American people, Puerto Rican people, Chicano people, Asian Americans, and Native Americans have been super oppressed and super exploited national minorities in this country. Uh, again, not simply because uh, there is a Ku Klux Klan running around in white sheets or because racism is in the heart of white people, although those are problems to be overcome, but because this system of national oppression is itself a source of the super profits that monopoly capitalism depends upon. And so national oppression becomes the form that enables monopoly capitalism to extract these super profits and to have in reserve these armies of labor that it can move around uh, uh, almost at will, uh, either uh, moving the black people up from the south to work in the uh, auto plants of the north or today develop, trying to develop a professional army with a very high percentage of third world people in it, much higher than their percentage in the population. That is why the Marxists say that the struggle against national oppression is also a progressive and revolutionary struggle. And that in fact, in our own country, the long-term strategy for making revolution is the building of an alliance between the oppressed national minorities and the working class as a whole. And when we say oppressed national minorities, we don't only mean the working class in among those oppressed national minorities, but we mean virtually all classes with the exception of that handful within each group which completely ties its kite to the interests of the monopoly ruling class. And those are a relative handful. That is why the Marxists, from a scientific point of view, not just a moral point of view, from a scientific point of view, have always seen that the struggle against national oppression and for democratic rights of oppressed national minorities is a progressive and revolutionary struggle. It is revolutionary because the monopoly capitalists are not capable of resolving that contradiction within their own system. Even though uh, liberal politicians come along and proclaim that they're against racism and they uh, want to make adjustments and they want people to get their civil rights and so on. Because to solve the problem of national oppression within monopoly capitalism would be to remove the source of super profits and to remove that reserve army of labor which can be effectively controlled because of national oppression. So it is that alliance between the multinational working class in this country and the oppressed national minorities that stands at the heart of building a long-term revolutionary united front against imperialism that will be the leading force in the revolutionary process. Within this struggle, uh, many people who uh, say they're revolutionary say, uh, we're so revolutionary that we think uh, uh, it's uh, useless and maybe even counterproductive to fight for uh, immediate uh, economic demands or reforms um, or uh, uh, bourgeois democratic rights. Uh, some, of, uh, some people who uh, put this forward uh, say that they're super revolutionary and these things are only uh, 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 ways that the bourgeoisie has of buying off discontent. The Marxist-Leninists think that this is an incorrect way of looking at the general struggle for immediate reforms and democratic rights. It's a mistake to think that uh, uh, for instance, the struggles in the 1930s that won social security or union recognition or unemployment insurance and so on uh, were simply elaborate plots by the monopoly capitalists in order to divert revolution. Yes, it is true that uh, this is part of the concessions that it is possible to win from the monopoly capitalists because they do fear the danger of revolution. But so long as the bourgeoisie has the capacity for utilizing reforms, it will do so. The struggle to win these reforms, however, does two things. It teaches the working class and its allies their political strength, 
It heightens their degree of organization, and it further exacerbates the contradictions of the capitalist system. So the struggle for reforms and for democratic rights is viewed by Marxist-Leninists as an important aspect of the revolutionary struggle. This includes labor struggles, struggles for union contracts or higher wages or better working conditions or whatever the case may be. Uh, it includes particularly and always has among Marxists who've taken the lead on this question, the struggle for the democratic rights of women, for the full emancipation of women. Uh, this is a struggle that uh, uh, some people uh, feel is uh, something that's only characteristic of the recent period of time. Uh, but the fact is that uh, the founders of scientific socialism, Marx and Engels, uh, paid great attention to the question of the emancipation of women. They saw the woman question, as it's called, as a revolutionary question because they understood that the oppression of women could not be changed or overcome, that women could not be emancipated within the monopoly capitalist system. Therefore, the struggle for women's emancipation is a revolutionary struggle, similarly with the democratic rights of the oppressed national minorities. But as the communists pointed out in the Communist Manifesto, the particular job of the communists is not simply to hold up the demands for immediate reforms, but to participate in those struggles at all times from the long-range point of view of the working class, seeing these struggles as schools for the making of revolution, seeing that it is the job of communists, revolutionaries, to help the working class learn from these struggles what the whole revolutionary process is about and to introduce not just the short-term demands, but the long-term goals and demands of the working class. Fourth, in order to make revolution, one has to be prepared to utilize all forms of struggle. Some people say, well, uh, we want to make revolution, but if uh, uh, it means uh, going outside the law, well, um, I don't know, I have to think twice about that. Um, it's uh, as an old friend of mine used to say, uh, 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 he talked about a professor, and I'm sure I'm not talking about anybody sitting in this audience, so none of you will be insulted by what I have to say. But he was talking about a professor he knew who was a radical and a Marxist in his heart. Um, and, uh, but every time he asked him to come out to a demonstration or a rally, the guy said, well, uh, he said, I, I'm really, I'm busy, I can't do it. And I says, but don't worry. He says, you know, when the day comes, when that, the real time comes, when we're all marching together against the capitalists and we're really going to overthrow, he says, I'll be with you if I can get a babysitter. <laughs> when we say utilize all forms of struggle, we mean that a revolutionary never starts out by eliminating any possible tactical weapon. It means that we say uh, we are not bound in the course of making revolution because the making of revolution is an illegal act. We are not bound by the legalities of an oppressive society. At the same time, we don't ignore all that can be accomplished within the framework of legalities. First, let us speak briefly about legalities. Uh, within the framework of the system here, which is called a bourgeois democracy, many things can be done legally, such as this meeting. Although I know it's being recorded and maybe I'm saying something illegal that will get, uh, if not you, at least me into some trouble. But uh, presumably, uh, uh, freedom of speech of this kind, uh, uh, under these kind of circumscribed uh, uh, situations, is permitted. Uh, and uh, we should make use of it. We should talk to each other. We should utilize uh, whatever possibilities exist, knowing full well that the struggle for power is not one that can be accomplished by legal means alone. First of all, even if it were possible, those who hold power would simply invent a few new laws, making whatever it is you were trying to do illegal immediately. So there's no point in having any fetishes about legalisms or illegalisms. One has to be prepared to do what's necessary. Ultimately, we have to understand that the making of revolution involves a violent transformation of society. 
and that there never has been a ruling class to abdicate peacefully, and that there never has been a class come to power that was not compelled to resort ultimately to violence in order to seize power. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, every act of what's called revolutionary violence is really revolutionary. I have no uh, use for uh, the escapades of Patty Hearst and the Symbionese uh, Liberation Army or that kind of nonsense. Um, they may be, uh, in some cases, even well-intentioned. But in the long run, they're meaningless. It is a slander against Marxism and Leninism to think that when revolutionaries talk about violence, they simply mean small group terrorist actions. Because what is characteristic of the revolutionary point of view is that it has confidence in the masses of the people. And when it talks about the use of violence, it talks about the mass armed struggle of the people. We're not talking about coup d'etats or small group actions that will topple uh, a, a group of politicians here or there or blow up a building. <coughs> We're talking about all of the ways in which the uh, majority of the people will ultimately be compelled to act in order to realize their objective. Another thing important to keep in mind is uh, what I would call internationalism. A revolution uh, in this country cannot be made in isolation from what's going on in the rest of the world. In fact, uh, um, the United States imperialist system is so central to what goes on in the rest of the world that uh, it should be fairly self-evident. But uh, for us in particular, uh, we should recognize that uh, uh, even though at this moment historically the revolutionary forces in this country are small and weak and quite primitive, we are not alone. We are part of a world process which if you examine, um, and you don't have to go to any great lengths to do it, you will see brings us into alliance and solidarity with the overwhelming majority of people in the world. Right now the storm center of revolution in the world is in the third world of Asia, Africa, and Latin America. And uh, we had, uh, as with the Indochina War, a living demonstration of what an alliance between people in an advanced capitalist country and people in a third world country can mean, where uh, all of the nonsense about patriotism and jingoism and so on, all of which is simply the ideology of the monopoly capitalist class who have no patriotism and no flag other than the dollar sign, that's the sign they were born under. Uh, all that nonsense uh, can finally be put aside, and we can understand that internationalism unites us with a common enemy. It means, in particular today, throughout the world, that we express our solidarity with people who are standing up for independence and liberation and revolution, seeing that the uh, while in the first place, in most instances, it is a struggle against U.S. imperialism, it is also a struggle against both superpowers in the world. And that it will do no liberation movement any good in the long run to simply transfer, transfer its uh, uh, dependency or exploitation by one superpower onto a dependency to another. This is the lesson that is being learned increasingly in the third world today and why uh, the unity of third world nations standing up against both superpowers is one of the most progressive developments. It also means understanding that all this talk about detente in the world is fool's gold. That the contention that exists between the United States and the Soviet Union is a very deep-seated, irreconcilable contention. And that the view that suggests that as the result of accommodation between the two superpowers, somehow people will liberate themselves is absurd. And any people who depend upon that as the strategy for their achieving liberation are bound to lose. 
I would refer people to an interesting set of editorials that appeared just last week in the New York Times. Um, after the uh, uh, recent uh, attempted coup in Portugal of a week or two ago, uh, which happened simultaneously with the developing offensives in Cambodia and Vietnam, the New York Times lamented on two successive days to make sure everybody got the point. And they said, in view of what's happening in Portugal, Cambodia, and Vietnam, what has happened to detente? Now, maybe that will strike some people as strange for the moment. Well, yes, what does that have to do with detente? The fact is that the view of U.S. imperialism about detente, what it is counting on in detente, is that it will be able to utilize the Soviet Union to help maintain the status quo of the world as it is. And if that's not going to be the case, because it isn't, the Soviet Union has its own interests to pursue, then that's the end of detente. Detente is a mirage. The contradictions between the United States and the Soviet Union are so deep and so real that although we are supposedly living in the age of detente over the last four or five years, the world has been brought to the verge of war several times. Uh, the uh, production of arms and ammunition has increased tenfold by both superpowers, and the world exists in an increasing state of tension. Detente is a fool's paradise for those who are serious about making revolution. It is also important for those making revolution and having an internationalist outlook to understand that there can be and must be solidarity with those socialist countries in the world, like Vietnam, China, others, and that the building of socialism in these countries is itself a very powerful force, as the Chinese uh, pointed out many times over in relation to Indochina. The existence of this secure rear area for the Indochinese Revolution was an enormous contribution to the Indochinese Revolution. Two more uh, points. In order to make revolution, one cannot rely simply on spontaneity, on uh, uh, acting as though the world was invented yesterday. Revolutionary theory is required. We owe it to ourselves.